Oh, very nice. There we go. All right. Um, my name is uh, Molly Cockerham, and I am currently the operations manager um, for a PT company called Advanced Rehab and Sports Medicine. Uh, a little bit about myself is I got my undergrad degree in athletic training from Illinois State University. Uh, and then right after I graduated, I did an internship um, with the U.S. Olympic volleyball teams out in Anaheim, California, which was really fun. Uh, and then I quickly got a certified internship at Savannah State University uh, with volleyball and track and field. Um, with that, uh, certified internship. One of the assistant athletic trainers uh, used to work for Western Illinois University back in, we're going back to Illinois now, um, where I was able to get a GA position there um, in volleyball. And so with that, my whole first uh, career goal was I really thought I wanted to be a division one volleyball athletic trainer. That was the goal. That was the path. Um, and then after my two years at Western as a GA, um, I received my master's degree in public health and healthcare administration. Um, and that kind of changed the way I wanted to use my athletic training degree. I loved working with the athletes. Um, I absolutely loved my time as a, an athletic trainer in the collegiate setting, but um, the hours were long, not going to lie. <laughs> um, and that is a very grueling atmosphere to be in. And I really just thought my skills were better set um, kind of in the more administrative pathways. Uh, so with that, I got a physician extender job at a place called Hinsdale Orthopedics, which is up in the Chicago suburbs. So I went from um, Western Illinois up to the Chicago suburbs. Um, and I worked there for a year doing some healthcare administration, but it was a lot of um, day-to-day -day stuff with an orthopedic surgeon, uh, rooming patients, taking vitals. It wasn't quite the administrative job that I thought it could be, uh, which that led me to actually looking back to Bloomington, Illinois. So I started in Bloomington, Illinois, and now I'm still in Bloomington, Illinois uh, um, uh, with Advanced Rehab. They had a job opening for a high school athletic training position here, uh, but then they also had an operations manager position. So I kind of interviewed for both and I was like, I would really rather do the administrative stuff, but I'm trying to get out of my job currently. And they're like, no, you'd be a perfect fit um, for this position since you have an athletic training background and some knowledge. Um, but I did not have any knowledge of how a physical therapy company is run, um, how that kind of stuff works. And I told them honestly up front at the very beginning, I said, I don't, I don't know how the day-to-day -day things of PT works. I can help you with the athletic training stuff, um, but that's not really my area of specialty. They're like, we'll just teach you. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> so um, with that story, never be afraid to kind of go or apply to jobs that you don't always think you're going to be qualified for because you never know what can happen. Um, so I've been here three years now. Um, we have 13 physical therapy clinics um, and eight high school athletic training contracts. Um, they're all kind of within the central western um, Illinois part of the state, and we do have one contract in Iowa. So, you know, getting crazy, crossing the border a little bit. Um, and then kind of how our company works. Um, not every company is set up like this. Athletico, ATI, um, Novacare, probably the bigger companies probably do things a little bit differently, but we're still kind of a small business. We have about 100 to 120 employees. Um, but we have two owners that are semi-retired. Um, so they kind of come and go. One lives in Arizona, one lives in Illinois still, but we kind of hear from them once a week or see them once a week a week. Um, then there's myself, we have an age director and then the finance director. So the five of us total sit on the exec team. So we kind of oversee everything that happens um, with the company and our offices are all right next to each other. <laughs> so we see each other uh, um, every day. And then each clinic has a clinic manager. Um, some of our clinic managers are PTs. Um, we have an athletic trainer who's one, and then we have a couple PTAs who are also clinic managers. So it's kind of a diverse setting. Um, the roles and responsibilities that I kind of oversee every day, um, we have a statistical management program that we use that tracks like um, daily productivity of our, of our physical therapist, so how many patients they're seeing a day, um, how long the patients are staying. So are they staying for four weeks? Are they staying for six weeks? Are we actually getting patients better um, during that time period? Uh, patient visits, so how many we're seeing a week, and then how many new patients are kind of coming into all of our clinics uh, we also closely track units build. So that's something that's brand new, obviously, in athletic training. Um, we don't really talk about billing, um, billing for services. Uh, so that was kind of a big learning curve on learning how to uh, properly bill for services um, through the physical therapy clinic. I'm also the infection control coordinator, um, which has been really fun with COVID. Uh, so my primary responsibility <laughs> was doing all the COVID policies and procedures. 
which has just been a joy. Uh, and then also making sure people are up on their vaccinations. We do require flu vac vaccinations as well. So um, that's been the past couple months is making sure everyone's getting their flu vaccines. Um, I'm also the HIPAA officer. So any sort of HIPAA compliance stuff uh, goes through me. I do the annual HIPAA training. Um, if you have any questions about HIPAA, let me know. <laughs> I'm the person. Uh, any sort of incident reports if a patient falls, if we have an angry patient because they got their bill, um, they didn't like the treatment that they had, um, that goes to me as well. Um, scheduling PT, PTA, or athletic training students, um, the observation students or clinical rotations, um, and then managing those contracts with the schools. Uh, any sort of continuing education courses for PTs, PTAs, and ATCs, uh, we put on about three per year um, through our company, which is really nice. Uh, so we kind of go through the process of scheduling those. Uh, Medicare surveys, which was also something brand new. So every PT clinic um, can get surveyed by Medicare. Um, it's usually every three years they come in. It's usually a one to two day process. And they come in to uh, make sure we're doing everything up to their standards. Um, and so I'm the person that goes out to, to help the Medicare um, inspectors to make sure that we're doing everything and that all of our policy and procedures are okay. Um, and then lastly, AT contracts, all the high school athletic training contracts um, that we have. And then I'm the backup AT for any PTO. Um, if an athletic trainer quits, any kind of things like that, then I am the backup athletic trainer. So that's kind of my daily roles and responsibilities. <laughs> it feels like a lot, um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> just a few things. Um, but really it ebbs and flows. There'll be times where you feel like you're running with your head cut off. And then there are times where you're like, do, 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 what do I do today? Um, so it very much ebbs and flows, but for the most part, I work Monday through Friday, eight to five. Um, so I'm very blessed with the schedule that I have um, at the moment. Um, especially because all of our athletic training positions are filled at the moment. So there's not a lot of extra stuff that kind of goes along. Um, any questions so far? That was a quick background of kind of everything that that, that looks like. Um, the other thing I wanted to quickly uh, touch on is how um, at least our athletic training contracts work um, with our local high schools. And we do have one community college. Uh, I think that's a uh, a lot of, at least when I was in school, that's not something I cared about is how the contract works. I just go out and I work and I come back um, and I get paid X amount of money. Um, but here, how we do it is that our schools pay us um, an, an, an X amount of money for the year, um, which is usually right now, it's about a quarter of the average salary. Um, we're trying to get that higher at the moment, especially because salaries are going up for athletic trainers and um, we are trying to kind of find the middle ground of paying the athletic trainer kind of what we deserve, uh, what they deserve, and then also doing a business decision as well, making sure that we're getting enough money on the back end. Um, most of our athletic trainers are contracted August through May. Um, they do work in the clinic over the summer, um, and they will do some clinic hours during the week. So all of our athletic trainers, um, go ahead with your question. Oh, did it just I was like I saw it come up? I was like, go ahead, feel free to interrupt. I, I can wait. Uh, you know, well, well, I'll ask it now. Yeah, it's um, fine. You know, I think like in in my in my students' perspective, you know, uh, you just kind of hit a hot top topic button, right? The pay. Yeah. And you're, and you're on the other side now, right? So you're on the administrative business decision side. Yeah. So, can you maybe talk a little bit about? what factors you go in to look at it, right? So is it, uh, you know, uh, NATA salary survey dollars? Is it local, um, you know, comparison dollars? So like, how do you go in to decide what somebody gets paid or not? Great question. Um, we do look at the NADA annual salary stuff. Um, what we will, what I will say when we look at that is that it's significantly higher um, than kind of what we, what we have for the region because, um, for the most part, living in central Western Illinois is relatively inexpensive. Um, so $40,000 down here in central Illinois will get you way more than it will in the suburbs of Chicago. So sometimes it is kind of hard to compare um, the NATA salary chart to what we pay our athletic trainers. Um, and I am, Illinois State is just right down the road. So we do try to talk to um, the program directors there and kind of get an idea of what they think is fair. And then we also have to look at what the high schools are willing to pay. And that's usually the biggest battle is how can we get the high schools to pay more money to kind of make up the difference. Um, and then we also, things that you don't think about as an athletic trainer on the other end, um, how expensive health insurance is per employee, how expensive 
uh, short and long-term disability is for each employee. Um, how much are payroll taxes for each employee? It's kind of like small little things like that um, that kind of all go into making the overall salary that I would have never thought about three years ago when asking and negotiating for salary. Um, that being said, we're in a super shortage of athletic trainers right now. Every state is. So I would encourage all of the um, new grads or people looking for jobs to definitely negotiate salary because there will be wiggle room. <laughs> people are desperate right now for athletic trainers. Um, so that's kind of towards the end of things to ask during an interview and ways to uh, to talk about salary during an interview, because we do I do sit on a lot of the interviews for the athletic training staff. Um, and it's not just athletic trainers. Um, physical therapists are asking for more money. PTAs are asking for more money. And the hard part with that is that we're not getting any more money from insurance companies. So even though we're billing X amount of money to insurance companies, we may make 30 to 33 percent of that. So. Insurance companies aren't reimbursing us any money, but the PTs and PTAs are asking for more pay, which is totally fair. I mean, very valid, especially the way that the um, inflation has been. But then it's weighing those business decisions of of how do we keep how do we keep afloat, um, and how do we keep moving that way. So it's definitely more complicated um, on the back end than you could ever imagine from a small business perspective. Now that's. I mean, I'm sure Athletico does different things. And and really my most of my experience is just in, in small business physical therapy clinics. So um it's probably completely different at the collegiate level of how to negotiate contracts and and kind of how that payment works from um a higher ed. My fiance works in higher ed, so I have an idea of kind of how <laughs> um how that pay scale works and it's completely different. Even the hiring process is completely different um, in a lot of ways than it is for us. So that kind of answer your question. That was kind of the loop around answer too. <laughs> no, that was, no, I think it's perfect. I think trying to get the audience to give a little perspective because it's easy to say, I want more pay, right? Yeah. But it's not an easy solution to that problem. Everything that you just said, insurance reimbursement, you're getting less dollars back. Right. Your consumers, high school, so on, don't have the money either to pay for right. it. Um, other professions are also seeking the same amount. Right. And so I think for the early professional to understand both sides of the equation so that they're going in informed when they negotiate. Yeah, so, absolutely. I think you did a great job. Thanks. Um, and a good example of that is just kind of how our PRN rate works too. So any other, like we have one school that we just contract, we just cover home events, they pay hourly. So our hour, our hourly rate currently is set at $30. So the school pays us $30, but we pay the PRN um, athletic trainer $25 an hour. Now that's not because we're trying to be unfair to the athletic trainer that's covering the school. It's because that $5 covers payroll tax, um, covers contract negotiations, negotiation time. Um, that's just clearly for us to break even. So that's not even our company making any money off of that. It's just clearly to break even on that amount. So I use that as kind of a good pay scale. Now, next year, we're trying to bump that rate up to $35 an hour <laughs> for the school to pay us. So then we can pay the athletic trainer $30 an hour and keep slowly bumping it up in that, in that regard for those contracts to work out. So that's a good question. Um, Another question, uh, one more uh, topic is that uh, obviously there's referral relationships. Um, so it's pretty known that um, athletic trainers that work for orthopedic groups or physical therapy companies, um, they go out and they're supposed to do referrals and track and bring back referrals into the clinic. And that's supposed to kind of make up the difference for whatever the high school pays. Um, now, I will say we do track referrals. It's just kind of a good thing to know, like how many you're sending from what school. Um, but our company does not do any sort of like incentives, referral bonuses. Um, there's no like negative impact <laughs> if you don't meet your quota for the year. Um, I just heard through the grapevine about how other companies have done that. And I said, that is absolutely not something we're going to do because it's sometimes so far out of your control um, for who what kids get injured that year. Um, but I'm very honest up front with our athletic trainers that it's something that we do track and we do look at, and it, it really comes in play with what contracts we're going to keep. So if we um, lose an athletic trainer, they leave, they go do something else. So now we only are down to seven athletic trainers. Um, in one high school, we only get five referrals from constantly over a period of three years. Well, if I had the option, I'd probably drop that one and then reallocate my athletic trainers. So um, that's kind of the biggest thing. 
Um, and the other important thing um, with kind of what I do in contracts and high school contracts is definitely having good relationships with the athletic director. Uh, so all the athletic directors kind of know who I am. And um, anytime we have to do contracts discussions, I want the athletic trainer for that school in that discussion too. Um, they do the day-to-day -day stuff. They know what works, what doesn't work, what schedules work, what doesn't work. Um, so it's definitely important that I have a good relationship, that the athletic trainer has a good relationship, and all three of us can communicate well about how things are going. Um, any other questions about contract negotiations for high school? We have one community college. I kind of just lumped that in because that contract's not really any different than uh, the rest of the high school ones. Yeah. I could ask questions all day long. Um, I love it. I would rather do that. <laughs> okay, well, cool. I, I, just, I didn't want to bother you. No. Um, have you thought about or considered uh, discussions with like the school board and the insurance companies uh, that provide the coverage for the school, not not necessarily the athletics portion, but who provide, um, you know, school fire uh, insurance and and um, safety pieces, hmm. and thought about it coming at it from a a safety litigation standpoint. I have not. That's a really good idea, though. Awesome. Um, yeah, yeah. I obviously with the the Heartland con, uh, Heartland Community College is the community college contract that we have, and they do the third party um, reimbursement for their athletes. Um, so obviously we've had some contact with that, um, but I have never talked to anyone regarding like the liability aspects for the high schools. Yeah, I just, how that works. Yeah, what I was just you know questioning because um, I'm not involved in that world. Right. But just one of the things like who has. Who has the most, uh, you know, who's concerned about dollars, right? So obviously the the school is, yeah. but the insurance companies that are providing school coverage, you know, who have to pay out on things, would they be potential partners that, you know, if we can put in, you know, the whole ounce of prevention, pound of cure, blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Would they be potential interested partners for helping to, you know, fund people that maybe can limit some of their, you know, their later costs, right? So if we can take yeah. care of an ankle sprain, uh, you know, much earlier, much quicker, we don't have to have the quote unquote ankle surgery later on. But, you know, that right. idea, I mean, I'm making it very simple, but something like that. No, that's definitely something to look into and a really good point. Um, something that, because I've had a few meetings with, um, we have two schools that are like in the same school district. Um, so we've met with their district board regarding um, cost and they um, currently they have one full-time athletic trainer and one GA at each school. Um, but the GAs are no longer going to be there starting um, 2023. So they're trying to get, um, they're trying to figure out funds to continue to have two athletic trainers at each school and where those funds are going to come from. So that's something definitely to kind of look at. Great. Yeah, I like that idea. Um, a lot of transitioning a little bit, a lot of what I do uh, on the physical therapy side is policy and procedures. Um, and I think sometimes with athletic training, that's definitely something that's put on the back burner um, for each athletic training room. I think a lot of times, especially like high school athletic training um, rooms, especially when I came into this job, there was no policy or procedures um, for any of the high schools. Um, so I was like, oops, we immediately need to get that in place. Um, so just some reminders for policy procedure, especially if you're just starting out, uh, make sure you have hot pack log checks, AED checks, um, biohazard bags for um, bloodborne pathogen stuff. Um, and then these, I listed a few important policy and procedures that should be included in any kind of PNP manual, um, lightning, concussion, incident reporting, dress code, infection control, so hand washing, bloodborne pathogens, uh, documentation guidelines, emergency action plans. Um, and then I added COVID too, because the COVID return to play stuff for a while there was a little complicated. Um, and even any sort of um, Medicare calls it emerging infectious disease. <laughs> Um, any sort of emerging infectious disease policy is kind of the umbrella term now um, for anything. Um, and then I always say, go back and look at NADA position statements. Um, those have been, I think, for a long time, the gold standard on some of these PNP things. Um, and then it always helps you from a liability perspective. Um, it's nice to have um, policies that you're following on the back end. And then um, each of every year, I review the policies, our athletic trainers review the policies, and then they review them with their athletic directors. 
Um, so everyone's on the same page with how many miles it should be into lightning, how concussion protocols work, when do they go see the doctor, what doctor do they see, do they see a doctor, when's the, when's the impact testing happening, that kind of stuff. Um, so don't sleep on your policy and procedures is pretty much that little reminder because <laughs> they are important. And I know at the college setting, um, they're pretty well standardized and you guys have to get them approved like by the school, right? As well, isn't there like a, some sort of process like that? I'm not as familiarized. Yeah, I would say each university is slightly different depending okay. on whether they have a medical model or, you know, a student health type of model or whether they're running through an athletics type of model. Yeah. I mean, I think each, it's, it's very institution specific um, that has their kind of model, right? You know, whether they have a, an associate, like our model is a, uh, an, as an athletics model with an associate AD that oversees all of the sports medicine performance type of things. Um, but other universities that I've been at have, you know, a student health model which runs through right. the student health system, which basically runs through the medical system. And yeah. so the checks and balances are through that, right? <laughs> you go through your annual uh, continuing edge for, you know, anything for, um, you know, everything, right? And and they handle that where sometimes it's, it's different if you're under a kind of an athletics model, so. Right. I say I work, I say at the small D3 version, um, well, we have to wear a lot of hats because we are a small university mm -hmm. um, and we are actually a faculty model. So almost all of our athletic trainers are both faculty and athletic trainers, which means we do not report to the athletics department in any way, shape or form. We are hired as faculty members. So we create our own policies, procedures. We have a team doctor that oversees us, but we go, everything is through him, but we are the ones that create everything. And he just gives us the okay or the suggestions if we need to change something. That's cool. So. Yeah. You know, I, I uh, and maybe you'll get to this, but um, I want to make sure I ask it because this is what I really wanted to talk about. Yeah. Um, what do you do? You know, we have a big burnout, you know, problem just in general, right? right. And COVID just accelerated these things. And it's not just AT, it's many okay. professions, right? Education, you, you name it. So what do you, you know, what do you do for professional development, culture development, leadership development? opportunity development, what do, what do you all do for those things? That's a great question. Um, the first kind of, the first thing that you didn't quite touch on, but that's something that I think is really cool that we do as a company, as an athletic training program, is we do everything we can to keep our athletic trainers at 40 hours and under, um, even during football season. Um, so I make the athletic trainers, uh, do calendars, which they hate doing, but, um, they do calendars and they estimate how much time they're going to spend out at the schools that week. So say they spent 38 hours at the school that week. Well, then you don't have any time for clinic because you're almost at your 40 hours and, you know, so-and-so is going to go over an hour or something like that. Um, then there'll be some weeks that they only work 25 hours. So then we kind of supplement that with an extra 13 or 14 hours in the clinic time. Um, so I will say we've kind of developed our own system to make sure that we're doing everything in our hands, in our powers to uh, make sure that they're not going over 40 hours, um, which at least has seemed to have a nice work-life balance. Um, the other thing, this is a great example of something that um, is really good for work-life balance that I try to instill. Um, so one of our um, football teams went to state. Um, state here in Illinois is over Thanksgiving. Um, it's the Friday after Thanksgiving. The athletic trainer for that school, um, his kids um, live in a different state and Thanksgiving is one of the only times that he gets to go home um, to see his kids. Uh, so we were able to find a peer and athletic trainer to work that state game for him so he could go home and see his kids. Um, here, family is a priority. <laughs> um, we try to do our best to make sure they're not working holidays um, if we can. Uh, we try not to do large tournaments over Christmas, over Thanksgiving. Um, there's occasionally there'll be practice on Labor Day, um, but then we try to make that up with PTO a different time that week. So say they have a practice on Labor Day, but there's not really much going on that Wednesday after Labor Day, then they'll have that day off instead. Um, so we do try to maneuver PTO and 40 hours a week to make sure that they feel like they still have a good work-life balance. Um, say there's a big football game, but, you know, my sister's getting married. You're going to your sister's wedding. <laughs> um, there are things that are more important in this world, um, especially in high school athletics. Like, this isn't Ohio State. <laughs> Maybe the coaches think this is, but this isn't, this isn't Ohio State, I promise. <laughs> um, 
As far as uh, leadership culture, uh, I try to have the athletic trainers uh, be involved as much as possible with contract negotiations, um, check-ins um, monthly. We have a monthly um, athletic training staff meeting. There's like eight of us. We meet for lunch once a month. Um, I call it therapy. It's a time that all the athletic trainers get together. We make sure that we have our day-to-day -day stuff done, but um, check in with that kind of stuff. But it's mostly, how are you feeling? How are things going? How's the how's your coach been doing? Um, we have a soccer coach that never tells anyone when the games are scheduled, scheduled or changed. How's that going with that? What have you tried? <laughs> um, we're really lucky that most of our athletic trainers are actually probably in their 40s to 50s. We're kind of strange where we don't have a lot of young athletic trainers. I'm one of the younger ones on staff. Um, so a lot of times it's what has seemed to work for you guys in the past um, and kind of let them run the show. And then I'm just here for any of the administrative tasks that they don't want to do <laughs> is kind of how that works. Um, as far as a physical therapy company, I'd say um, it's really important for us to know, like when I, we are, our, our clinics are far away, but we go out um, to each one once a month. So one of us on the executive team will make sure we go out to each clinic once a month for their staff meetings, um, at, answer any questions. You know, I know that so-and-so's uncle in our home clinic um, has recently been sick. I know that someone's mother is sick or so-and-so is due with a baby in a couple weeks. Um, I think we do pride ourselves um, to having a good family atmosphere and kind of keeping in touch with how everyone's doing um, and kind of putting mental health on the, on the forefront. Um, because if you're not making yourself um, happy or if you're not happy, then you're not gonna get your patients any better. Um, so we do do some continuing ed with mental health stuff. Um, one of our PTs is super into um, burnout rate. Um, she has a lot of research in that um, and she does a lot of lunch and learns. So probably once a quarter, we try to do a lunch and learn where one of our PTs or PTAs or athletic trainers will pick a topic to talk about. Um, and then we do hire in um, continuing ed. So there's a company called, we recently did a blood flow restriction one. Um, that was really cool. And then there's another company um, that does modern management of the older adult. Um, that it's the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you guys have heard of that company, um, they're really cool. They do a lot of really fun stuff. So am I missing any other part of that question? I'm trying to think. No, it was good. I, I, gave you <laughs> I can go off on tangents for days. No, I think it's, you know, I think a lot of times people just don't realize you know, what, how you develop culture and leadership um, and, and help people through, right? I mean, yeah, everything from hours work to, uh, you know, holidays to um, just, you know, what, what's their, what's their five-year plan, right. right? And, you know, it's tough when you're in the grind of, you know, two a days and it's August and, you know, you're doing it for their second or third or 15th year in a row. Mm -hmm. Like, well, what else can I be doing um, you know, to kind of grow. Right. So, yeah. And I, I mean, I've really been in this position only three years and before this, I haven't really held, um, I would say a high position in any sort of leadership. And so it's been a big learning curve for me. And, um, I think the more you can kind of learn from others and, um, I, definitely the couple other people on the exec team with me, they've been running this company for 20 plus years. Um, so it's definitely a lot to lean on them too, um, to see how they've kind of built the company up and um, things that have worked and things that haven't worked. Yeah. So like, what, what do you do? Do you have executive coaching for anybody or anything like that? Yeah, we work with, um, I'm going to, her name is Shirley, but I'm blanking on what her company name is. I will remember after this, I'm sure. Um, but we do quarterly managers meetings. So we meet with all the clinic managers um, and the exec team. We meet for a day um, and she'll come in and we have our own things that we talk about updates and thus such, but she usually comes in and does a three, two or three hour course on leadership or we did um, one about what kind of leader are you, like the disc training. Um, the one that we did most recently was kind of like how to to find the positives with everything with COVID um, and kind of how to rebuild your attitude. Um, so that has been really helpful as well to have her come in. Now, not everyone loves doing it. <laughs> Some people roll their eyes every time we have to do it, but um, it has been really helpful. And a lot of our clinic managers um, have been clinic managers here at their company, probably 17, 18 uh, years plus. Um, so they have a lot of good leadership skills too that we 
we bank off of. Um, and there's a lot of good mentorship um, for our younger clinic managers as well um, that or some of our more successful clinics um, will take some of the other ones under their wings and kind of show them what they're doing. Um, and so we kind of pride ourselves on having an open door policy and making sure that there's plenty of people to go to for help, um, which has been super important. And is that uh, kind of more organic or is it is it uh, like you have a process for that? It's definitely more organic, I would say. Um, it helps that we meet uh, quarterly as like a big clinic manager team. So everyone kind of gets to know each other. Um, some every once in a while, if like a clinic is struggling, like recently a clinic has been struggling with billing appropriately, their units, they've kind of been billing lower. Um, and so we've emailed a clinic manager who does a really good job billing and we'd say, hey, can you help them out? Or can you look at these notes? Um, so if we notice problem things, um, we kind of uh, pick a clinic manager that we think that would be good to help solve the problem. Um, and then every once in a while, um, it does help happen organically. Will someone will reach out to someone or um, personalities really um, get along really well and they become really good friends. Um, that also happens quite often too, where people will just text each other, hey, how are you doing? That kind of stuff. It's been really nice. Um, so I guess both. Yeah, no, it's awesome. <laughs> both is nice. It's nicer than to say, uh, than to try to email everyone and force everyone to be um, good colleagues. Because sometimes I feel like that can happen. Uh, any other questions about that? Uh, the last kind of thing I want to touch on are things or questions to ask during an interview. Um, these are things that I've more learned from sitting on the other side interviewing people than I've never asked any of these questions really um, when I was interviewing for jobs. Um, but here's a, just a couple of things that I came up with. Um, the first thing we talked about earlier is don't be afraid to negotiate. Um, definitely, I mean, get through the first initial interview and see what the salary range is. And then if you have a second interview or an offer, um, don't hesitate to, um, don't hesitate to negotiate that time. I would also highly suggest reaching out to other athletic trainers in the area. Um, most people aren't really too shy about telling you their salary. Um, now I can't tell what other, what the other athletic trainers that I have on staff salaries are, that's not allowed, but <laughs> it's their information that they want to deal do with. Um, and then also look at cost of living in your area. Um, again, Chicago is way more expensive to live in in central Illinois. Um, $40,000 goes a long way down here, but not so much up there. So definitely pay attention to where you live um, as well. Um, and then um, a good thing that I like when people ask is, does the company do an annual review? Do you get reviewed at all how you do over the year? And then at that annual review, is there any opportunity for a pay increase? Here we do um, annual reviews. And uh, we're switching ways, but the old way was um, if you hit a certain mark, then it'd be a 2% increase in your pay and a 1% bonus. Um, we're moving to like a 3% method and it's changing, but that's kind of the way that we do it. Um, so I definitely ask if there's any room to grow um, as far as financially um, after your first year, is there any 90 day bonus? Um, sometimes there'll be a pay increase at 90 days too. I would never hesitate to ask about that. Um, as far as athletic training questions, um, do they measure any sort of productivity? Um, do you have to have referrals back to the clinic? If so, how many referrals? Um, are there any referrals incentives? And then how does PTO work? Do you get it accrued? Do you get paid holidays? Do you get sick time? Um, if something is happening on that paid holiday, do you get a different day off that week? Do you get an additional day of PTO? Um, any sort of PTO negotiations, if they say, hey, we can't do salary, then immediately I would start saying, okay, can I get six hours of pay period instead of four hours of pay period. Can I get a couple extra days of six time um, and kind of do it that way? And then make sure that if you have an important events come up in your life, um, weddings, um, things that you need time off, make sure that you can get that time off. Or at least, you know, they have a backup person that can help you out. Or if you get really sick, do you have a backup person? Um, and then definitely do some research into additional benefits. Um, I'm telling you at the age of 22, I had no idea what a 401k was or the importance of a 401k. Um, even at, I mean, I'm just now learning at 29. So um, 100% would ask about a 401k or if you're at the uh, school level, is it like a 401b or it's slightly different if you're at the university level. So I don't, I don't want to talk about that because 
I don't, it's a completely different, and it's, I think it's different in Illinois too, because we have like a pension program for state employees. So it's totally different by state if you work at a community or at a collegiate setting, but any sort of uh, private practice, athletic training or hospital setting, um, they should have some sort of 401k program and a match. So I would highly, highly encourage young career athletic trainers to look into 401k programs, um, healthcare benefits, making sure your current physicians are in their healthcare network. Um, do they have an HMO? Do you have a PPO? How much of the company has paid that? Um, so I pay most of my uh, health insurance benefits, but my fiance, he works for a university. He pays none of his health insurance benefits. Uh, he pays nothing. So um, it's a good deal. Um, so it's definitely something to always ask about and other things to negotiate other than salary. I would say if salary is a big stickler, then look at ways to make sure you're getting appropriate health care for a 1K and um, PTO. Um, that's kind of all I had at the moment. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Those are kind of the big bullet points of what it looks like. The only other thing I did um, touch on at the end too, I just saw a post-it note that I remembered to say, um, if anyone's at work looking to work in administration, you don't have to have, I would say you probably don't have to have like a public health or healthcare administration degree. I know a lot of people that have kind of worked themselves up through the ranks of the bigger companies, um, started out as a high school athletic trainer, um, and then have kind of worked into more administrative roles um, in some of the bigger companies and hospital settings as far as uh, clinic manager duties and that kind of thing. Um, if you are interested in that, then I would just ask your administrator how you can help them because I guarantee your administrator is going to need some help in some capacity at some time. So um, in my opinion, making good connections and even brown nosing a little bit sometimes goes a long way. So, <laughs> so it, does, it doesn't hurt to always ask. Uh, if anyone else needs more help. Um, but if you would, I liked, I loved public health and healthcare administration. Um, I love working in a physical therapy clinic. I think it'd be really fun to transition into more of a hospital setting one day or something like that. This, um, But uh, there's definitely great, and MBAs are also great. I think that would be a great addition to any sort of athletic training degree as well. Um, if you're really looking forward to going back to school, I'm done. But if anyone else would like to go back to school, they're more than welcome to. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? This has been fun. Thanks, guys, for um, the three people in attendance. <laughs> I appreciate it. This is great. Thanks for letting me join in. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I think your information is awesome. Uh, hopefully, I can see the video and you know let the next group of students and the next group of students and so on and so forth see that there's just so many different ways that your athletic training background yeah prepares you for a variety of different ways that you want to go right so you're absolutely you're used to wearing many hats you're used to uh you know hot, really intense and then you know slow periods you're used to uh you know reading people and communication and problem solving right and yeah it's kind of what you do on a regular basis right so Absolutely. I would say um, athletic training sets you up for a, very, a lot of different careers, especially being able to work in a fast paced environment and being quick to think on your feet, I think are really important skills that you learn um, in an athletic training program that you don't get in a lot of programs and forced to work with people. <laughs> even, even athletes that you don't always, you know, you always have your favorite athletes and you always have your annoying athletes. I mean, it teaches you how to uh, be a good be a good athletic trainer and a good employee to everyone. So. <laughs> Maybe we can stop recording now. <laughs> there you go. Yep. We're good.